How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. Brian Alvarez is not here right now, although he's expected to join us before the end of the show. Uh, he's uh, actually doing an acting gig today up in uh, Seattle. But we do have uh, Mike Tanay, who is already on the line from uh, Las Vegas, the uh, head, head, the host of uh, NWATA, which does the first pay-per-view, uh, first Sunday pay-per-view, of course, on November the 7th, talking about that, as well as anything else you want to talk about. We've got a couple of lines available at 1-800-878-PLAY, so if you want to join the show, you can call in right now and you can get on board very quickly. Mike, how are you tonight? Dave, I'm doing great. How's everything going with you? Ah, everything's going pretty good. Going good. Um, I guess uh, a lot of stuff we can talk about today, and I know that uh, that you're pretty much caught up on the WWE stuff, as well as obviously the TNA stuff. And I think the first thing, since you're here, that we should talk about is uh, the TNA show on the seventh, and uh, your thoughts on, you know, this is this is a big thing because you got to get off to a good start on this one. Um, there's a few, you know, we always talk about like the, the carrot dangling, you know, and, and 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 different things in the future. You know, you you always want to, you know. When when the company isn't you know necessarily knocking them dead you know you know there's the thing that you hang on for is you hung on for the TV um, the TV shows that its ups and downs um, has not maintained the audience um, there was but of course the TV still could get a better time slot you know it was it was getting your foot in the door you had to do that and now the move from the Wednesday pay per view to the Sundays which should save the company money virtually everyone in the company that I've heard is is behind the move but you got to make the Sundays work now. Boy, no, no question about that. I do think the move was inevitable, and I think it was, uh, you know, from, at least from my standpoint, I, I think it's time now that that we really, for for the the best long term aspect of the company, that we go to the special, uh, you know, once a month Sunday three hour pay per views. Of course, the realization is going to set in on November seventh that we have that one chance. I think to make that. That first big impression on that show, and as a result, I would, I would just be shocked if I would be surprised if everybody, from top to bottom in that company, from A to Z, to have their working boots on in an effort to make this a very memorable show for the the TNA fans. And it's going to be a big one for us. There's no question about it. And I and I think probably the you know the biggest event in the two and a half years of the company's history, is especially in terms of how we go forward from there. Um, I think it's the biggest since maybe the first show. Um, as far as um, just it's it's you've got to get up on the right foot and um, you know get some momentum also uh, coming out of it for your TV show. And I want to ask you now. Now this week on on a Wednesday night actually is a real big night for the company in, in a sense. You know the pay per view is big for your regular viewers and some people who might be trying something out because it's traditional Sunday and because it's the biggest show in company history. But Wednesday is a taping for Best Damn Sports Show, period. And on that one, your company is going to be exposed to a general sports audience, to more non-wrestling fans, I think, than you've ever been exposed to before. So um, it's, you know, certainly it is your best opportunity to make new fans, um, you know, on this, this, two, this two-show taping on Wednesday that will air sometime between November 8th and November 12th on Best Damn Sports Show. Yeah, I think it's it's really huge for us. Uh, one of the things is, as I deal with uh, the TNA product on a regular basis, is just getting the word out to the masses. And I think that that's something that this Best Damn Sports Show really has an opportunity to do for us. I think there's a chance for a lot of crossover potential in terms of the audience here, uh, being able to get exposed during time periods that uh, you know the people that have not had the chance to to set aside time on a Friday afternoon or that they haven't gone out of their way to tape it or TiVo it. This is going to be a chance also for us to, to, to wave the flag and let them know that we do exist. So I think it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be big for the company. Uh, I am excited about the pay-per-view event coming up on November 7th, the Victory Road Show. I think there's, there's a little bit of something on this show for everybody. I think there's some potentially some really terrific work with A.J. Styles, P.D. Williams for the X Division title. Uh, Going to see a lot of the high flyers involved in that X Division gauntlet. I think we certainly have recognized personalities on this show. Uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper returning with a pit segment, his surprise guest. We also have Dusty Rhodes, of course, and the the vote, the fans vote uh, for the director of authority between Rhodes and Vince Russo. And you have a main event that is that is really just loaded with intrigue. 
You have Jeff Jarrett, Jeff Hardy for the NWA World Heavyweight title. It's going to be a ladder match in playing to Jeff Hardy's specialty. And then you also have the, the X factor, that equation of the outsiders being thrown into the picture, the return of Kevin Nash and Scott Hall to professional wrestling, and the intrigue there is as far as uh, where those individuals, really where their loyalties lie. So I think there's, uh, it's, it's a show that I'm excited about, and I think uh, November 7 is going to be a big step for us. And that's the first big step, and the second big step is going to be those uh, Best Damn Sports Show tapings, which actually are going to come up this week. It's going to be a very busy week. Well, the one thing with the Best Damn Sports Show thing, and um, um, Brian Cox and Monty Brown are going to do a tag match, and Tom Arnold is going to referee a minis match. I think that um, there might, you know, there might be a chance. I don't know if you can get, you know, something with that, um, you know, to cross, you know, a lot of promotion on that station, and maybe even on other things. If you can do some sort, you know. The key is if, if you can work with them to do some sort of a big angle to lead to something on a pay-per-view with a high-profile thing, get some guys rubs. Um, I mean, it's hard. I mean, believe me, I rack my brains on a daily basis, you know, trying to come up with, like, you know, the brilliant idea like Mike Tyson and, you know, and Steve, you know, and Steve Austin that, that turned uh, the WWE around in 1998. Um, but that's, you know, that's what everyone, you know, that's what the business needs right now is that idea that, catches people that really have not been paying a lot of attention to wrestling and gets them, you know, um, you know, I mean, I, I know it's the million dollar idea and, and obviously nobody has one. <laughs> because Boy, and, and that audience is out there and, and I really believe just in, in, in talking to people on the seats and talking to people at airports, uh, restaurants, casinos that I go to, you know, I really get the, the impression that there is an audience that once again would come back to wrestling uh, if, if handled the right way. And, and I think our biggest obstacle at this point is just getting the word out to the people that we exist, period. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that these best damn sports shows are going to take at least, uh, they at least take some of that hurdle and some of that obstacle down and, and get the word out about the product and, and try and direct people to watching the regular shows on Friday. Well, yeah, the, it's, I think your other big obstacle is, is and I, I think the one thing that we've really learned um, over the years is that this is a business of star power, and it's so hard to create new stars um, when the business is down, and it's actually fairly e when the business is up, it's actually fairly easy, and yeah. and and you know the whole thing is is that um, you know there's there's plenty of guys, you know, I mean we've all seen you know AJ Styles and everything like that, who's you know great wrestler, and other and and and, and I'm, not, I'm not the only one. But people don't see these guys as stars, and um, you know, for twenty nine ninety five. The other thing is, is, is on, on pay per view, and I've really seen it. I'll tell you, I saw it Tuesday on uh, the, on the uh, WWE Taboo Tuesday, and I saw it again on Friday on the UFC pay per view. That people are far less willing to spend the big money on pay per view unless they think it's going to be can't miss. And people now are thinking pay per views are missable. I mean, we've seen it. WWE made a big mistake. Uh, running, I think the two pay-per-views a month, and I think they really need to get away from that. I think that that, I think that lesson's been been, been taught twice now, and um, you know, you, and with UFC, I mean, if you don't have the main event, people will skip the show. I think what you're saying is there's just so much product to choose from when it when it comes from grabbing that that pay-per-view sports audience coming off the two huge boxing matches, the multiple. WWE shows, the UFC show this week. So, boy, you're right, Dave. It's uh, there's it's it's a discerning viewer out there that's going to you know plunk down that money for the pay per view. So, that's why you have to you really definitely have to pay that off once you do get that viewer. Boy, it's it's going to be tough though. Yeah, you're going to give them you you have to give them a good show, but you're also going to have to make them feel that it's worth it with um, some you know stories that happen at the show. And I mean with with Hall and Nash coming back, obviously there's going to be some sort of a story and some sort of an angle with that. But uh, it, it better be good. Um, I mean, you know. Well, the whole show has to be good. I mean, the show has to deliver uh, from an in-ring standpoint, uh, from certainly from an angle standpoint, from an announcing standpoint. You know, the pressure's on everybody to deliver on November 7, and uh, I think that we're, you know, I think we're ready. I think it's been a great two-and-a-half-year learning experience for everybody associated with the product, and I think we're ready to take that next big step, and we better be. Yeah, they're st talking about some other things. Um, now, again, now you, you mentioned to me before we went on the air that you're all caught up on watching WWE, and uh, what the, the, tough, the tough enough thing? Mm -hmm. um, fitting. I, I mean, I'll tell you what. Fitting into that show, and you know, and we're going to have this for the next eight weeks. What do you think of tough enough in the body of SmackDown? 
uh, in the body of the show, I thought was a negative to me. Uh, I enjoyed the segment. Had to be well over 20 minutes. Yeah, 23 minutes. Was it 23? Yeah. Uh, I certainly enjoyed this segment. I thought it was uh, some of the some of the best WWE programming that I had seen in 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 recent months. And at the same time, as I watched the show, both leading into it and leading out of it, I just got the impression that that uh, that it would have been better served from a from a standalone uh, show standpoint. I, I think it, especially these days, as I watch that. I just thought that maybe somebody missed the boat this time on bringing Tough Enough back and letting this thing go and really getting behind it. And I know that's something that I'm sure they approached the networks on, and I'm, I'm sure this was probably the best resolution that they could work out. But in, in watching that, I was definitely intrigued by it, and at the same time, thought it would have been better uh, standalone away from the wrestling. I think that everyone knows. I think that everyone knows that the question is: is now how does this affect uh, the next eight weeks of SmackDown? Because Again, like, and you know what, I, I agree with you, and we've talked about this before. I, I, I didn't like the idea of it as part of the show going in. In fact, I thought it was going to be a real negative on the show. Now, I think that the, the, there's some very charismatic guys. Now, where it goes in the long run, I don't know, because you're going to have some guy win a million dollars who's not ready to wrestle, and he's going to have to go on that show, and that's going to be very tough on the guy. Very tough. But the... Um, I I didn't expect my attitude, which was when I watched it, to be, wow, it's it's it you know that's overshadowing the wrestling show. I thought that it was going to be just this boring interlude on the show, kind of like the diva search was on Raw. I mean, this is you know again they did a great job on that on that first segment. Could there be a bigger contrast in the quote unquote reality type segments than Monday's Raw diva segment and Thursday's Tough Enough? I know. Unbelievable difference. Oh, I mean, for, for something that, you know, look, looks on the surface to be similar, you could not have two wi a, a wider variants than, than what went down on Monday with that Diva segment this, of this week, Raw, and how good uh, the Tough Enough segment was on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, um, in, in watching it, uh, I think there may be something to do with the, the, the fresh faces aspect of it. And I think that's probably going to help uh, Cologne, and I think that's going to help Hayden right well. I think people are just ready. They're at that point where they want to see some fresh new faces, and, and let's put them out there whether they succeed or fail. And, and I think that's going to be another uh, aspect of the Tough Enough that's going to be a positive, and I look for it to be, just judging by that first week, I look for it to be uh, a help in terms of the ratings for SmackDown. Okay. Um... What are your thoughts? Uh, first, before I, I, I want to mention, I thought that the guy they cut, who was 40 years old, was the most unbelievable character to come along the pike. I mean, the, I saw that guy between his facials and his look. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't, you know, even, you know, he, he lied and they cut him. Um, I mean, you know, I'll tell you what, I mean, if they're going to get rid of everybody who lies in wrestling, we ain't going to have a business, but that's another story. But, but I mean... I was so compelled by that guy. I mean, um, now again, I mean, it means nothing because if he couldn't wrestle, and that's the problem is you've got, they picked a couple of pretty charismatic guys, but it means nothing if they don't pick it up. I mean, um, you know, it, and, and, and here's the other thing. And that's the hardest part of, of the voting because there, there's really, it's, it's really difficult for them to be able to present to the, to the fans that are voting that in-ring ability aspect of the, the the final eight. Well, and also because you have the one, you've, you've got the one thing that's inherently unfair, and that's uh, Mike the Miz, you know, who's been, who's had two years of training in UPW, wrestled many, many independent matches, has, has had a lot of television. I mean, in the aspects of professional wrestling, in the aspects of talking, in the aspects of being able to present yourself on television, he is a, you know, he is worlds above the other seven guys who were all. Basically, you know, jocks who, um, some of whom are pretty charismatic and some of whom, um, you know, all of them have good physiques. <laughs> As you can tell who they are, or almost all of them have good physiques. And, um, but it's, it's, um, it's going to be interesting because you, again, we, we, you got the people voting and, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think, see Mike the Miz and Dan Rodimer as the big favorites. I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, again, I was surprised that they, they, they cut the guy that they did for, for lying. Um, 
It made it made for great television, but I don't know if that was the move that they should have made. I don't know that the, the payoff for that one segment is, and, and it was great TV, but is the payoff for that one segment worth uh, losing the potential of giving this guy a chance? And again, well, I think I think we, we really didn't see. Yeah, you know what, what what they saw also in, in terms of uh, you know whatever he was able to deliver in that short time period in ring. Um, that's true. How, however, the other thing is is I think that the reality also was is one of the reasons they cut him was because he was forty. Um, I mean, you know, starting somebody out. Um, I mean, you know, Rico Constantino had you know so many obstacles against him. Um, if he if Rico if Rico was ten years younger than he was, he'd have been on the main roster earlier, and he had to work his way through that whole mentality of. He's 40 years old, and he's just starting in this business, and nobody wanted to give him a break, and um, even when he was the star at OVW. Um, and I think that their feeling is just, you know, they want guys in their early 20s. Most of these guys, I think, are between about 23 and um, 27 or so. I'm not sure of the age of everybody, but, but most of them are, are fairly young guys. And then you have this one guy who's 40 who um, was an amazing character. That's all I can say. Um, one Real quick, uh, before we, get to, we start getting to the calls. You know, your Hall of Fame ballot was freaking uncanny. Um, and I know you worked hard on it, as, as we all did. Um, but you had the top 11, and not all of them got in. Seven got in, four did not. But of the top 11 finishers in the ballot, Mike Tanay, who picked 11 people, 10, uh, 10 people in uh, uh, Jesse Ventura um, from the non-wrestler category, um, you got all 11 right. That was... Um, <laughs> what do you attribute that to? I, I, I don't have the slightest idea. I don't, I don't know what this says. Um, I know what it said. I know what a lot of people know what a lot of people would say about it, but <laughs> I know I spent hours uh, putting together the information both for the balloting as well as for the 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 radio shows that we did leading up to that. So I definitely put my homework and put my time into it, but uh, it, it certainly was something that I was trying to do. I was more or less just shocked when I when I remember seeing the results and just how every one of them in order went right, just went right down the line. It's uh, scary. Yeah. What are your thoughts now? I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the thing. Um, you know, we haven't really, no one's really called the show about it. I wish they had, actually. But um, I guess the, the big, um, the big, you know, there hasn't been a big controversy about Triple H not making it, except for a few people. And I think, um, but he, and he had tremendous support among WWE wrestlers, just so people know. Um, Kurt Angle certainly, I think, has been... On the message boards I've seen, the most controversial pick, yet I know a lot of people who were very, very strong on him. And um, if I remember, wasn't that your number one pick or number two pick? Him and Undertaker. Yeah, we talked about Undertaker initially. Yeah, Undertaker and Kurt Angle were your, were your, were your two big picks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked that people would uh, would even, you know, would consider, you know, not voting for for Angle. That, that, that really is a surprise to me. I mean, I can understand the... The people that may have a political backlash towards uh, Triple H, although you know, I'd certainly consider him Hall of Fame uh, material, and I, I I voted for him, and it was really close. I mean, wasn't he just like a ba- uh, he, he was, him, two ballots away from getting in? He and Jesse were both two votes away from getting in. Yeah, and and Angle made it right at sixty percent, one less vote. If, uh, if you know, one, and he's not in. So I mean, that was you know that was a couple of tight people. The one you know the other ones, um, obviously Sakuraba and. Uh, Undertaker and Bob Backlund. Well, Bob Backlund didn't make it by uh, Bob Backlund made it by enough. But um, you know the the real tight one was was certainly Kurt Angle who won less vote. And I mean the big argument on Kurt Angle, of course, was the number of years pro. Um, and I mean I I I'm, there's a couple of changes that I'm going to make next year because I do actually understand. I, I you know I voted for Kurt because he was on the ballot. And if you see that name on the ballot, I, I to me you know I mean a lot of people are for whatever reason you know. Trying to say that he's not a, a great wrestler. Everyone I talk to in wrestling, um, you know, nothing but raves. If you talk to guys who wrestle Kurt Angle, and I mean the top guys, I mean I, I'll tell you something that's 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 funny is like I'll read something where um, oh you know Kurt's not as good a wrestler as so and so, and the so and so who we're talking about is someone who I know very well and talk with who does believe that he's even in the caliber of Kurt and I wrestled Kurt probably fifty times. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, isn't it tough to believe that just people have that? I mean, if, if it's one thing to, to say that he hasn't put in the years, and if, if that's going to be your determining factor, then I understand that. But how can you ever go down that other avenue talking about how Angle doesn't deserve to be from a wrestling standpoint? Yeah. So, but that just doesn't make any sense at all to me. Well, people have different. You know, I mean, you know, when it comes to Bell to Bell, a lot of people have different visions, and and the other thing that you know you learn is that people don't have much tolerance for people's visions. 
<laughs> I mean, that's just how it goes. Anyway, uh, we're going to start getting some phone calls. We're going to start in Jacksonville, Florida with Brian. Brian, what's going on? Hey, uh, Mike, how you doing? Um, Hello, Brian, how you doing? Good. It seems like I've heard your name before. I, um, I'm, I pretty much stuck mostly with the, the WWF growing up. But can you tell me a little bit about your background, how you got into the starting the TNA and what you did before that? Wow! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only, only how many? Only how many episodes of Nitro? <laughs> well, the first question that I expected today. I think about 250. Yeah. Nitro shows, and uh, I worked for WCW for uh, for I guess what? Well, gosh, was it nine years, ten years, something like that? Yeah. In that neighborhood, uh, and uh, prior to that, I did. Uh, speaking of national wrestling radio talk shows. Uh, I hosted a national wrestling radio talk show called The Wrestling Insiders from 1991 until, oh gosh, I guess 95 or 96. And prior to that, and this may sound familiar, <laughs> did a wrestling newsletter. <laughs> I edited and published a wrestling newsletter and wrote uh, articles for Wrestling Newsstand Magazine. So that's, I guess that's my wrestling. My, Mike, Mike's background, Mike has been around wrestling for about as long as... Almost anyone involved in the business. There's a few that have been around a little bit longer, and very few. <laughs> but uh, That's true. Now that you put it that way, um, you know, I mean, you know, starting as a fan in the '60s, but you were doing. Um, what, what year did you start uh, your newsletter? It was like, it had to be what, '69-ish? 1966 through '73. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 1966, <laughs> almost 40 years ago. So anyway, he's got almost 40 years of being around wrestling. And, um, I mean, I haven't said it on the show, but Mike is. Of the people that I've been wrestling, and that's about everyone, Mike is very high on the list, easily top five or six, if not top one or two, uh, most intelligent people when it comes to this business that I've ever come across. I mean, I'll say that, and, then, and a lot of people will say that as well. So um, we're going to go to Ed in San Antonio. Ed, what's going on? Hey, guys. Um, what I want to ask about is I bought the Rick Blair book, and uh, I was reading the chapter where, uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of the guy's name, but it's where he... Uh, he actually dropped it out to the local hero. Jack Veneno in Puerto Rico? Or in um, yeah. um, San Domingo, maybe? Yeah, yeah. That or, one. or Victor, or Victor, Victor Javica. Yeah, and then, like, uh, because he was scared for his life, he let the guy keep the title. He came back. They went back for the rematch. That, rematch. that might have been Javica, because I don't even know if he ever went back to face Veneno ever again. He may have. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Veneno was the, the... There was one... You know, I, the two stories are so similar because they're both, you know, basically, um, you know, in the islands. Um, one of them, um, I, I remember that, you know, Piper was supposed to interfere. Yeah, that's the match I'm talking about. That's okay, and uh, they just got scared to death that they were all going to get shot, so Rick just told the guy, that might have been Veneno, and just goes, cover me. <laughs> and they counted to three, and they gave him the belt. But, yeah, not, neither of those was planned. Okay, the question I do have is, Okay, Rick said, Rick, Rick said that the guy offered him the belt back after the match, and so he took it. Mm -hmm. The question I have is... Okay, that's, the, that's Veneno. That's Veneno. Okay. Had the wrestler decided that he said the hell was it, and he decided to keep the title, what would the NWA have done? Would they have recognized it and sent him... No, they would, have, they, would have, they, would have, they would have ignored it like they, in fact, did at the time. You know, news traveled a lot differently in those days, because this is early 80s. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, and I was as well-connected as almost anybody, and... I, I would say that months later, I heard rumors about it. I mean, literally nobody even knew it happened because it was in Santa Domingo. I mean, it, it, it wasn't even in, in San Juan where people kind of did get news. You know, San Domingo, nobody got any news, even though I think there was like, you know, 20,000 people or something at the show. It was a huge deal at the place. But, uh, no, they would have just ignored it because the fact is is that nobody even knew it happened. Um, and Flair never really publicly talked about it until the last couple of years. So I, I could say that... I don't think that I even knew for sure that it happened until, I don't know, maybe in the last five to seven years. Really? Yeah. My... People, people that became wrestling fans during the Internet era have no concept of how wrestling news traveled, uh, I mean, in the 60s, 70s. I mean, before, before the Observer, it was unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's so different, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, I mean, in those... It was so jaded because it was all, like, pro-wrestling and illustrated. Uh, it was all worked, basically, too. Um, well, 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 yeah, I mean, most people got it from the magazines, the mag and the magazines were, aside from being very outdated in, in those days, a lot more than they are now, that, um, yeah, and it was all work storylines, and, and they had their they had their magazine favorites, you know, um, that, that they pushed, who, you know, those magazine favorites never did jobs, even when they did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh -huh. In the, the pre-email era... 
you can't believe how many results that as a, as a publisher or an editor of a wrestling newsletter, you receive the majority of your information initially by mail, secondarily, a little bit by telephone. Very little in, in, when we were around, when we first started. Well, really up until the last maybe 10 or 15 plus years, I would say. And... I mean, even though the information was dated from a newsletter standpoint, it was still months ahead of, of newsstand magazines. Yeah. Okay. And another uh, Flair title switch. I know that he switched. He dropped the title to Cologne, and that's also not recognized. Uh, that was uh, the way they recognized that was Cologne was the WWC champion, Flair was the NWA champion. I think that they had a cage match in '83, and I could be wrong about the dates. Uh, might be, Atlanta, but 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 it was right around that time, and Cologne got out of the cage to win, and he won the match, and they billed him as the Universal Champion, which was supposed to have been a higher title than either of them, and, and the Universal title became the main title in WWC, and, it, and is still to this day. Um, they, I, I, I'm trying to, remember, you know, someone sent me a whole big thing of exactly how it was done on Puerto Rico television, and I do think. That they may have called Carlos the NWA champion on Puerto Rico television while still defending it, while Flair was still defending it in the States, but I'm not sure. You know, I, I actually had that in the Observer um, many, many years ago, but I don't remember the exact details of how it went down. But Because I, I know Flair wrestled Cologne. Flair still went back there for, for a while as NWA world champion. Later, so they must have done something or some type of a ruling where he ended up in on their television as NWA champion again. Um, before, um, after the Brody death, I don't think Flair ever went back. Okay. Well, how did the NWA committee uh, feel about putting Flair in the title match where they're actually fighting for a title that, like you said, was supposedly higher than the NWA title? Did they know about this, or, I mean... Um, in, in those days, um, uh, WWC was one of the hottest promotions in the world. They paid big money for it. It was outside the United States. They, the, the, the way the communication was, they figured nobody would find out. And, in fact, nobody in 83, hardly anyone did find out. In, 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 you know, the, the, the Japan actually has always been far better covered than Puerto Rico. So it actually, uh, doing a title change in Japan, you know, um, that, when they first did the first one, which was Baba beating Jack Briscoe, they thought nobody would find out about that. But everybody found out about the Baba beating Jack Briscoe, and they did have to acknowledge it. But with uh, the ones in Puerto Rico... Um, because of the nature of how news never got out of Puerto Rico to the United States, I don't think that they were all that concerned. They just figured, well, it's in it's in Puerto Rico, and no one's going to know, and and almost nobody did know. Okay, and also on a similar subject, from how you guys dropped the title to Baba, did he was he reprimanded for that, or no? That was all by then. That you know they'd done that many times, and. Um, you know, Baba paid big money, you know, for those title wins. I think uh, I think Harley might have gotten as much as 40000 the last time, but it was certainly 25 was what Briscoe got the first time, and I think that was the going rate where you would get your – Baba would pay the NWA and, and pay the champion, uh, and that was a great payoff for, for a wrestler, you know, for you know for a bonus, that was you know, um, to get the one week, and, and Baba would give it back at the end of the week, and it was just – that was just one of those things. No, no. I mean, in Race's book, he makes it sound like it was his idea, and the NWA had no idea that he was going to drop the title to Papa. Uh, I seriously doubt that. That they would have had no idea because even with Briscoe, they all knew ahead of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't have been his idea because it had been done. It had been done before with Briscoe. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for taking my call, guys. Okay. Very welcome. Is that Race's book out? I didn't even know that. I didn't think it was going to be out for a while yet. Yeah, they have excerpts on a website. That's oh, okay, okay, okay. Because, um, yeah, I know Race's book is coming out very soon, but I didn't know that it was out yet. Yeah, I was actually looking forward to reading that. There's so many books coming out. The Funk book, Terry Funk book, I already know is a really good book, as we've talked about on the show before. And um, uh, J.J. Dillon's coming out with a book, too. So, anyway, we will go to uh, Guy in Ladera Beach. Uh, what's going on, Guy? Hey, how you guys doing? Doing really good. I had a question as it concerned uh, Ultimo Dragon. He's, uh, I know he just recently retired the gimmick, and he's going back to WWE, where he was a pre prelim wrestler previously and will most likely be that again. And I just wondered uh, if you guys knew the reasoning behind giving up a legacy and uh, the type of thing he has in Japan to be a prelim wrestler in the U.S. Um, that's a... You know, I don't know all the details of, of Ultimo Dragon... Um, I know that you know he's living in Mexico City and he's still going to be able to train guys and he's as a trainer it's you know his track record's unbelievable, but um, you know he's still going to be training wrestlers in Mexico and and work and, and flying out of Mexico to work WWE when he comes, um, which might be as early as November. I mean I don't even know if they have a set date, 
Um, but yeah, I think I think it's inevitable he's going to come in and be exactly in the same spot he was when he left, which isn't very good. And um, um, you know, I don't know why he wants to come back. I don't really even know why they would want him back. But he, you know, he is coming back. So I, and 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 uh, you know, I mean, he did lots of jobs on the way out in, in Japan, knowing that he was uh, you know given gimmick. So because I, I I seem to come to realize something. I don't know if you guys agree, it, it seems easier for a heavyweight wrestler in Japan to retain his legacy. Way after his working, you know, prime has passed, as opposed to a junior heavyweight who made his name on his work. Do you think that could be a possible reason? Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that that's the reason. I mean, the reason he first came and signed the contract was because one of his goals in life was to appear at WrestleMania, which he accomplished, and one of his goals in life was to wrestle in Madison Square Garden, which he accomplished, and he had to go to WWE to do both of those. Um, now that he's done those and didn't do well in WWE, you know, why he's going back and why they're taking him back? I don't really. Know the answer. I don't know, Mike. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? I just can't imagine, uh, after seeing uh, how he was handled the first time, that he's going in any way, shape, or form to be able to add to his legacy uh, by going back there. Um, so I, I can't imagine that that's a reason. Uh, boy, uh, we know he's a, a big fan of the business, and he always wanted to be a part of that uh, Madison Square Garden uh, big WWE and hitting his childhood growing up WWF show that he always read about uh, when he was growing up in Japan, but I'm absolutely shocked that, that once he achieved that, that he is going to go back. Yeah. And uh, one, one other question about TNA, um, what, what are you guys' feelings on with the one-hour television show? It seems to me a few of the guys who are coming across as stars uh, on the two-hour pay-per-view, mainly guys who are doing interviews every week like a Raven or a Monty Brown, aren't coming across quite the same way on the one-hour weekly show and what you guys feel uh, a one-hour weekly show is enough to retain a whole promotion these days? Well, it's a good question, and I think that it's a, it's a, it's a real struggle every week to, to get everything jammed into that, that one-hour impact show that we do. I, I thought the show that aired this past Friday was uh, one of our more recent, stronger efforts, and uh, I, I think I would agree with that if we had that luxury of having uh, more time, it would certainly enhance our ability to get the characters over. And, gosh, you know, maybe something's going to happen along those lines here in the next couple of months where, where we're able to not only have a one-hour impact show, but also have a one-hour explosion show that's on equal footing, and, and maybe that would help it out in that effort. All right, that's all I have. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, any talk of uh, T-Upgrade? I mean, we certainly had heard a lot for a while there about a potential uh, late Saturday night slot, perhaps um, explosion um, being added to the uh, Fox Sports Net lineup. Um, anything new? I mean, I know nothing's official. I, I mean, just any scuttlebutt, anything. Yeah, definitely there's talk about it. Nothing definitive at this point. I think it was it was important that we took that first step. We got on Fox, and now to me personally, I think if we are to take that next step, it's going to have to be with an upgraded time slot, uh, whether it is the Saturday night slot that's, that's been mentioned and rumored. I think some kind of a weekend slot is is a must. And my presumption is that our showing on Best Damn Sports Show is going to be critical on a lot of fronts. I think both in terms of maybe reinforcing our position with Fox Sports Net as well as, you know, continuing to, to open up the eyes of the people at TNA Management that given the right publicity and given the right time slot, that we do have a product that can attract a number. So I, I think it's, it's really a must for us if we're going to take that next important step. What do you think is the most important thing to uh, get TV that's hooking people? Because right now, I mean, let's face it, nobody in wrestling is doing that right now. Man, that's, that is the, the $64 million question of all time. Yeah. I, I think that uh, we need to continue to do everything within our power to try and uh, create those new stars, the guys that we've had that are just right on the brink uh, of, of breaking out. I think AJ really has in terms of the, the wrestling audience right now, he's attracted the attention that, uh, that there's no way that, that he's been able to attract any kind of a mainstream audience. And I think that, to me, is the most important thing, just coming up with, with a hook that would get that, that big national audience and get them to tune in and at the same time create those people that are recognized as stars, definitely create new stars at the same time. You have to have the recognizable faces. Yeah, the thing I think the thing on uh, Wednesday is very critical in the sense of it 
AJ or somebody can wow those people where they talk about it every now and then. Yep. And that's the kind of people, you know, that kind of buzz that you talk about, Best Damn Sports Show. It's not the most highly rated show, but it's it's one of those, you know, things that if, if it's if it's part of their scene, it becomes to an extent part of the scene. To John in Kentucky. John, what's happening? Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, I just got a few quick uh, questions for y'all. Uh, I consider myself a real big wrestling fan, you know, as far as what's going on, you know, behind the scenes from y'all show and whatever and everything. But I don't understand, and this question kind of goes to Mike. Why didn't they put uh, TNA? I've never seen it, you know. I'm and I'm a, a Dish Network su subscriber, and there's are so many people out there want to see the show. They're not going to pay the extra money to get that channel. Why didn't they try to put it on a channel that's part of a basic package? Because any wrestling fan on a Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever, you know, if wrestling's on, we're going to watch it. Well, John, I think in, in an ideal world, there's no question that uh, TNA would like to have its product, uh, say, on a Monday night, maybe. Yeah, uh, going head to head with uh, the WWE product on Spike TV, and I think there's no question that in in that in that ideal world we would like to be on one of those uh, type stations, whether it's a, a USA network or whether it's an FX. Well, it's what I'm saying is to really boost them ratings. Don't go head to head with Raw right away. Get your fan base, get you know everything that you want. And then yeah, later on down the road, you know, a year, whatever, <laughs> had to hand That would be off. great, John, if, if that was the case. But under the circumstances, to be very honest with you, uh, the Fox Sports Network uh, Friday afternoon package was really the best that we could do right now oh, I on, on several fronts, from a financial standpoint, from, from many things. Uh, that was the best time slot that we could get on that network because they have so much live support. So I think you're right. It would, it would be ideal to have it. Uh, on a, a more recognizable network. That's not the case right now, but I would disagree with you. I think that there is such a built-in Monday night audience that people, uh, for the part of 10 years, they know when it's Monday night, that's wrestling night. They know that they can watch uh, wrestling on Monday night. So I would disagree with you in saying that we should try and, and go to a different time slot, then come back and attack them. I think, uh, just think, think back to the WCW uh, WWF Monday Night Wars and, and how the key was that being able to switch back and forth between the two programs. Right. That, that game of can you top this? Who was who was going to uh, top the other wrestling promotion? And I think that, that that would be a huge boost to the wrestling industry right now. And and I think if you know if we could pick that one dream type, that's what it would be. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was wanting to know about the John Cena deal. Yes. Uh, if that was legitimate, what they was talking about on TV. No, John Cena is in Australia doing a movie called The Marine, and he'll be there for uh, another couple of months, I think. So he really wasn't hurt or stabbed? No, 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 no. That's just a storyline for uh, Carly Colon, so there's something for John Cena to do when he comes back. Uh, okay, that's what I was kind of figuring. And uh, the second question is, uh, can you give me a rundown on what happened on Abo Tuesday? Because I wasn't able to uh, get it. Sure. And what you thought of, you know, I mean, from your professional opinion and everything. Um, last two matches were good. Up until that point, it was pretty bad. Um, Randy Orton beat Ric Flair in the cage match. It was very bloody, uh, like an old school cage match, really. Uh, good match, and um, Ric Flair and Randy Orton hugged, which will be real interesting to see what happens on TV Monday when it comes to the character of Ric Flair. Uh, uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels ended when Edge speared Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels had knee surgery this past week. For real, uh, he's going to be out for a while. He went in with a bad knee and um, did a gutty job. It wasn't the. It was definitely not your normal uh, Triple H Shawn Michaels match. Some people did not like it because Shawn was so limited and probably shouldn't have been in there. I kind of liked it just because it was something different, and I thought Shawn's selling ability was incredible. Um, Gene Snitsky uh, beat Kane uh, because Kane is uh, Kane, and, and injured Kane. Kane's going to be gone also to Australia doing a movie for the next couple months. And um, in the tag team title match, Chris Benoit by himself beat La Resistance. Edge was his partner, but Edge walked out on him. Eric Bischoff got his head shaved after Eugene beat him. Uh, you don't want to hear about the women's matches. They were horrible. I mean, they were the Carmella match was especially horrible, and she's, I think she's gone. I think that's it. And uh, that, was, uh, that was largely it, really. All righty. Well, that's what I needed, and uh, I, I appreciate it. Okay, very welcome. Okay, let's, okay, you too, John. Let's go to Mitch and Berkeley. Mitch, what's going on? 
Hey, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, Mike Tanay, it's great to be on the phone with you. I uh, met you so once at a show San Jose, and you were one of the nicest people in business that I've ever met. Um, Thank you. So I just want to let you know that. And I, I really wanted to talk about TNA. And uh, I'm just a supporter of small things, whether it be a small punk band or a small wrestling organization. Whether I like it or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I paid extra to get MLW on my satellite, and then I canceled that, and I paid more to get you guys on on what you're on now, Fox Sports. And just when I was ready, like it didn't get me right away, but I was ready to get that cage match. And they, it's not carried on DirecTV. So my first question is, is when will I be able to watch pay-per-views via DirecTV in the future? Wow, Mitch, that is a, that is a great question. <laughs> As Boy, isn't it? someone who is also uh, a DirecTV subscriber now, I happen to be able to have both direct TV and cable, so it doesn't impact me necessarily as much as you. But uh, as I may get there if that twenty four seven thing's only on cable. So, as somebody who's a direct TV subscriber alone, boy, I would really have to feel for you. I just know that it's a that there's a business a disagreement between right. sides, and uh, I wish I had better news, and I wish I told you that it was resolved and that we'd be back up and, and running for the Victory Road pay per view. But I have not been told that. So my presumption is that they have not made a deal with DirecTV. Has it affected you guys much on the, on the numbers of the last pay-per-views, the last couple without DirecTV, or not necessarily? You would think that just from the, the audience that, that were icing out because of that, that it would have to affect it uh, drastically. Right. I can, I can imagine that it wouldn't be a you know change in the numbers. Do you sell the tapes on your website? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Do you sell tapes of the, of the old pay-per-views on your website? Yeah, we have our, our DVDs that are like uh, compilations, like best, best of DVDs, right. where it's it's Don West and I host them, and you have a different subject matter. You have best of the world's title matches, uh, best of the tag matches, best of AJ Styles. So I would definitely suggest that uh, that that would be a way to get caught up in a hurry at a at a bargain rate. Would be to check out the DVDs that are on our website tnawrestling.com. And I got a couple other questions about TNA, and I hope I can speak candidly about it. Go. Of course you can. Um, um, <laughs> first is, is, is Don West the guy that used to sell the baseball cards? Wow, the one, the one and the same, the guy that used to be at the Shop at Home Network that you used to watch at 3 o'clock in the morning. I did. That's right. You can't buy five of these. Get on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's the same guy, and it's, uh, it's, it's really been a great experience uh, working with him. How did he cross yeah. over? You guys such a character. How did he get into wrestling? He was approached initially by Vince Russo mm -hmm. uh, to come to WCW. Uh, this would have been in the... Oh, I didn't, I, never, I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was approached by WCW. Oh, yeah, the last year or so that WCW was around. They would have replaced Madden for him, probably. <laughs> I think, from, from what I've heard from the conversations, that they approached him about the Thunder Show. Okay. Um, but, you know, who knows? That's certainly the story that I've heard, but I, I think that Don has made incredible strides and right now working with him is as much fun as I've had working with any broadcast partner and when I tell you that that covers a, a heck of a lot of ground when you look at people like Bobby like Heenan Ian, right. and, and Larry Zabisco <laughs> and you know that and does he? Don really cares <laughs> about uh, the product Don got the job that he does and well, he's a great we guy to work with. Add him somewhat, and I'm sure he seems like a cool enough guy to laugh at himself. But we we miss him on that baseball card thing because late at night we would just put that on for entertainment because the guy was just like five star promo, 110 percent caffeine, just on anything. Oh yeah. What he's well, you get a little taste of that sometimes during the Impact show, especially when he's trying to sell you the forty nine dollar package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To meet the road pay per view. So that's just you, you get a little taste with with the TNA. Right. And the other question I had on TNA was I don't know style wise it seems like it's going it, it, it's it's bringing in some extreme stuff um, but it's all it's doing it's doing kind of a hybrid and doing a little bit more of a mainstream package and in this day and age that's probably the safest thing to do but when I watch TNA what I'm wishing is I like it I want to love it the way I loved ECW and the way the crowd wore all the t-shirts and it started this revolution and I want it to do that and I don't know what it would take to do that and, and, and I'm just wondering, for, and it doesn't mean that if you did that, it would be great, and if you didn't, it's that. It just means, oh, I wonder what it will take for TNA to get that fan frenzy um, that they created, that almost gang-like uh, following. 
Boy, that's a tough one where everybody's rooting for the home team, right? Right. Uh, I, I don't think that it's hardcore. I think that was one of your suggestions, that maybe we go down that uh, that road. I don't think that's it. I, I think the opposite, uh, actually. I think for us really to survive and for us to, to thrive uh, today, we are going to need to be as mainstream friendly as possible. Right. And I think I said it when we... When we initially signed the deal with Fox Sports Net, I thought that it would be probably uh, one of the best things in terms of fallout for signing that contract with Fox Sports Net, that it would, in essence, uh, force us to police ourselves. Mm. And think that I think we've had a, uh, a, a family-friendly type product that Fox Sports Net has been very proud of and, and pleased to, to have on their show. And... and I, if, if we all had the answer to that question about what would uh, take it to the next uh, next level, you know that would be that would be easy. We, you know, we all plug that in. But uh, I think we're headed down the right track, and I think we just got to continue to work down that path uh, to get that kind of acceptance. I love the Canadian angle, by the way, and I love and I love the pile of like the flip pile driver. Oh, P. Williams, like great finish for that. I feel like I'm eight years old again and trying to rewind the tape and figure out. Like I remember putting the Boston crowd with my friend. <laughs> out what the hell they were doing because now it's also it's just all, we're so oversensitized that we uh, we understand it all and moves like that and then I love the Canadian angle and I'm wondering if Lance Storm is working for the WWE back behind the scenes or if, or if you could bring in him or somebody like that to put over the Canada angle as, as more of a main event angle I, too, I would disagree with you there because I think that Scott Demore He's has just done a, a phenomenal job uh, as, as, a, as a heel manager, uh, in, in getting the kind of response that the Canadians get, I I don't think that, that that's the the problem in the least. I would definitely stick with Demore role. I mean, I'm with that. I just mean I would like to see that at the end of the show, but maybe that's just because I'm more of a hardcore you know fan, really into the, the, you know the really you know awesome wrestling opposed to the big names. And I I do like Jeff Jarrett a lot, but I just think that the Canadian stuff is fantastic. And and uh, and my final. Uh, my final comment, two comments are, one, I love that you show Hogan constantly getting buried on that Japanese press conference. And number two, um, I just wanted to say that the guy that didn't remember you or who you were or what you did, that in the dying days of WCW, maybe that's not such a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there was... There well, was... Uh, that was 1,500 TV shows that I did. What did we used to do? Just sweep those right into the carpet? <laughs> but, I mean, there was, there was some, you know, you got to remember, there were some periods, you know, like in, in early 98, WCW was on fire. That's yeah, plus, Mike was also the fish. Man. He wasn't the, the loud, I mean, a lot of people didn't know Shivani by name that weren't die-hard wrestling fans. It was just kind of, you know, the straight guy. And then who's that crazy guy next to him, Heenan or somebody else? And, yeah. Uh, and and I, I don't know. Mike, I think you're great, and uh, best of luck to TNA. And I, I watch every week on Sportnet. I've got it on my TiVo, and uh, I'll always support it. It's the greatest invention ever, isn't it, Mitch, TiVo? You bet your ass. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to have a child unless we got TiVo, so there you go. Okay, if I, if I had TiVo, I wouldn't have had a child. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. We're going to go to Regina, Saskatchewan, and Trent. Trent, what's going on? Uh, first time caller, but long time subscriber and listener to the show. Really enjoy it all. Oh, thank you very much. I had two questions tonight. Uh, the first one I guess concerns the, uh, new guys or, like, the tough enough guys and stuff that WWE is trying to bring in. Mm hmm It seemed like, like, Brock Lesnar was got a lot of money and pushed to the top and got fed up with all the stuff, like the travel working conditions and stuff. Do you not think that the more WWE looks outside traditional wrestling or traditional wrestlers to, People from athletic professions where they're treated much better do not think they'll find a lot more Brock Lesnar who will look away after a while? I think Brock Lesnar was one in a million in about ten different ways, and one of them is the fact that he walked away from that kind of money. I don't think that, um, um, you know, I mean, if you had a guy who could, who could uh, uh, let's see, like, uh, you know, play in the NFL for real, um, yeah, I could see them, you know, there's so much money in the NFL that they would leave professional wrestling, but, you know, if you... Had a guy, um, you know, um, Brock Lesnar was so confident in, in his athletic goals. One of the reasons he left, um, the main reason he left, I mean, he was fed up. He didn't like to travel. Um, as a person, you know, he's a unique person. I mean, he doesn't like being around people that much, which is pretty difficult for a pro wrestler. And obviously, as an athlete, Brock Lesnar is one of the, you know, the greatest athletes that's ever come along. I mean, for his size in pro wrestling, um, you know, right at the top. So, like I said, he, it, it's... Um, He's just a unique guy. Um, I 
think that if Brock Lesnar doesn't make it in football, and the odds are he will not, that Brock Lesnar will be back in the WWE and, and for goods. I don't know that Brock is like a washout. I don't think, um, you know, it, you you got to love pro wrestling because it's so physically hard on you and the travel is so hard. If you don't want it bad, it's going to be tough to do it. Nevertheless, if we look at the tough enough people that, that have been in it, None of them have quit. They're all, all of the winners are still around, and, and a couple of other people from Tough Enough, Chris Nowinski and um, Matt Morgan, um, you know, who, who didn't win Tough Enough but ended up getting developmental deals. Anyway, they're all there. No one's quit yet. So, um, so I don't think the quitting is, you know, again, Brock Lesnar is a unique individual. I don't think the quitting is, is um, if you survive the Tough Enough, um, you're going to survive. You're probably going to survive the odds, say, OVW, and, and OVW in many ways is probably tougher than WWE, because at least with WWE, you're making some big money. Mike, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's just impossible to, Trent, to really simplify things uh, like you, you, you mentioned there. And you're, you're looking for that individual that not only has that athletic ability, but also the, the total passion for the business as well, and... It's, uh, boy, it's, it's tough to get that all in one package. Yeah. You know, Brock was, you know, the one uh, other thing also, a lot of these guys on the Tough Enough thing are, you know, big, big fans. And certainly, I'll tell you, the guy Brian um, Carluti, uh, that wasn't the name he used, I think Brian Danowich or something, you know, that, that was one of the gutsiest things I ever saw. Um, I thought wow, it was. With the, the, the torn, the torn, uh, the, with the torn, with the torn back and, and torn bicep and then going through the obstacle course. And I mean, you can tell, man, that guy, that guy, if he ever got a job in wrestling, he's never quitting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and probably could answer some of the questions on Jim Cornette's OVW test. Uh, maybe, I know, yeah, when they test those guys. Trent, anything else? Yeah, um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was I heard first that TNA was coming on to TSN up here. Oh, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Oh, isn't it? I read uh, that WWE wasn't happy about it then. That may not happen. Does Mike or do you know more about that happening? I, th I think you're probably as up to speed on this as I am. I mean, that's kind of the fallout that I've heard as well. I really don't have any further of an update to say that, you know, we're definitely coming on at, at a specific time. Dave, have you heard anything? I haven't heard anything, you know, at, at all as far as, um, I mean, the deal seems on hold, if anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, the deal was obviously pretty darn close. It hadn't been signed. And, uh, you know, what happened? I, I, I All I can say is, is, is being around wrestling as long as I have and being around television as long as I have. Um, the idea that because it leaked on the Internet or because Scott B. Moore said it on a radio show before they had a chance to announce it that the deal fell apart, I don't buy that for a second because every single television deal that I can ever remember in professional wrestling, everyone leaked before the station announced it in, in The Observer and you know, since the Internet era in the, in, on the Internet. There isn't, I mean... There isn't one deal that came to shock. I mean, this, this Fox Sportsnet deal with, with uh, TNA, I mean, my God, we were writing about it for months and months and months, it seems like, you know, before, while the negotiations were going on week after week before they announced. The idea that, that TSN was mad that it leaked before the contract was signed, and that's why it's not going on, I just don't buy that. I don't know, Mike, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, would, I would agree with that as well, and, um, you know, I'm not even sure how much there is to, this, to the stories that I've read about the WWE, obviously not. You know, wanting the competition on there too. I, I, I just don't know. I don't. You know, I don't know. If, I'm not saying it's WWE. I, I, you know, I've been told it's not. But you know, I mean, everyone's going to tell you whatever. But I just the story that TSN gave um, is just something. It's a story I buy. So, but yeah, no. Uh, there's no start date. There's no uh, definite thing one way or the other. So. Okay. Well, I'd like to see a TNA up here. I've always enjoyed much work in WCW. Uh, Trent, thank you very much, and uh, hope that uh, we're able to get that kind of exposure up there. I guess right now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, are they, are they not showing, uh, is it ESPN Classic Canada yeah. showing the early pay-per-views right now? Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. about yeah. it right now. I don't have access to that, but they, they are showing it. So there is some presence up here, and we could order the Wednesday pay-per-views yeah. as well. But nice to see uh, a more mainstream exposure for TNA. Oh, gosh, no question, Trent. You know, and even... Like even WCW didn't, never did WWE ratings, but they they did okay. And yeah, you know, it's, I'm sure it's sure sick of all of what WWE does all the time. But <laughs> yeah, it's been nice to be exposed to something different. Yeah, Trent, thank right, thanks a lot. Okay, Trent, thank you very much for calling and uh, call again, please. Okay. We will go to Scott in LA. Scott, what's happening? Hey, good evening, Mr. Observer and Mr. TNA. How are you tonight? Hey. Sounds like Scott Walton to me. It is Scott yeah. Walton. In a flash, <laughs> in a flash. How are you, sir? Very good. Everything. Good, Dave. I hope you're doing well. Doing well. I want to let everyone know Scott Walton is the son of uh, Jeff Walton, who was uh, Mike has known for oh god since the beginning of time, and uh, you know Jeff uh, 
did publicity and TV announcing for the old Los Angeles promotion. In fact, did the uh, WWF magazine, I think, when it first started around 84-ish. That's right, the very first. Yeah. The first magazine ever, which not a lot of people would know about that. So, But uh, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I just want to say, uh, of course, to Mike, I always catch uh, TNA every day at 3 o'clock in Los Angeles. It's a great show. I enjoy it uh, every time. And the guy mentioned uh, about TiVo, which I have as well, and uh, I never miss a beat. My question is, pretty much, and Dave, I think I w- I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. What Are there any plans whatsoever uh, if for TNA to come out maybe to the West Coast, say Las Vegas or Los Angeles? Uh, are there any plans uh, for that? Well, I, I wish I could give you a specific date and say, yes, there's going to be an event such and such a date, but I can't do that, but I can tell you that uh, I've had our management people, including Beth Jarrett, looking at site in Las Vegas, Nevada, Mm-hmm. And I would be shocked now that we're going to the the monthly Sunday pay-per-view schedule. I would be shocked if we were not doing a show, one of those Sunday pay-per-views from Las Vegas, with uh, within the next say six months or so. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Because I mean, I enjoy TNA. I'm, I'm especially looking forward to uh, seeing Victory Road because you really got a good product on your hands. And, and you mentioned about branching out. And I just hope you know that someday. I hope in the near future. Uh, and I hope close with that uh, TNA will be able to uh, come out on the West Coast, especially for Los Angeles, for that matter. Yeah, I think it's important also for the company just to to increase that visibility, that that we do have a presence outside of Tennessee and, and outside of Florida. So I, I think that's that's also important. You know, we're talking about Victory Road. I, I just thought of a couple of matches that, I, Dave, I don't know that, that we talked about or not today, but in addition to all the ones that you mentioned before, there's going to be a minis match that's right. uh, featuring uh, – uh, the, the midget wrestlers from Mexico, and in addition to that, I think arguably uh, my favorite feud of the past six plus months or so in TNA has been America's Most Wanted at Triple X. Now, what kind of a, do they have? Um, a, is that going to be a cage match or any special match, or, do, or has that even been announced yet? It hasn't been announced yet, but uh, my understanding is that it's going to be Triple X and AMW in a last team standing match, sort of to determine. Once and for all, who is the best uh, tag team in, in TNA history? So I think when you factor that in, that Triple X AMW match, and in the Mexican Minis, Abe and PD Williams for the X Division title, I think there really is going to be an awful lot of solid work on that show November 7th. Okay. Okay, Scott? Yeah, uh, Dave, thank you. Uh, one, I want to make a quick uh, last compliment uh, to Mike. I just want to say that uh, Mike and Bobby Heenan were the MCs for the Cauliflower Alley Club for the past few years. And Dave, I need to, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well, and I read this in your wonderful Wrestling Observer newsletter, I never miss an issue, that uh, I'm sorry, I, it's just too bad that they're not going to be doing it next year. Uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I wish that things had gone better at the last thing to where they would have wanted to come back, and I, believe me, I understand what the problem is, and um, I tell you what, if they weren't there at the last show, that would have been, uh, uh, it would have been a really long night. It was a long night anyway, but but Bobby Heenan was so fantastic. I mean, you go, you guys who saw the, the WWE Hall of Fame DVD, it was another night exactly like that. Bobby was just as good at Cauliflower Alley, and Mike, you know, Mike works with Bobby so well, and uh, they saved night for me. I'll tell you that. Yeah, me too, Dave. Thank you so much for taking my call, Mike. I'll always watch TNA. Um, your number one fan is talking, and uh, you guys have a good night. Okay. Okay, thank Scott. You, Scott. All right. Thanks for the call. Thank you for taking it. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. We're going to go now to Vancouver, British Columbia, and Chris. Chris, what's going on? Hey, guys. How's it going? Going really good. That's great to hear. Mike, I enjoy your work. Uh, Thank you very much, Chris. I think you're one of the best announcers in the business. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, First, uh, Mike, um, I want to know, get your opinion on, in your time in WCW, um, which wrestler just didn't make it who you felt probably should have been, like, right at the top with the Flares, Hogan's, DDPs during that time. Wow, as world champion. Yeah, that's a tough the one. The politics or whatever, like who's there, like who didn't make it. Uh, I think one of the guys, in my opinion, was Perry Saturn. Never got a really good break. Uh, what are your comments on that first? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put Perry Saturn in that group. I'd have to sit here and and think. I mean, I have a name in mind. Uh, Chris Benoit. Yeah, I have. I have two. Na- well, two names in mind actually, and. I was going to talk about Chris Benoit. I was going to talk about Rey Mysterio. Yeah. Two completely different. Right, Rey Mysterio. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I would say more the whole cruiserweight division as a whole is more, more than just Rey Mysterio as an individual. Right. You know, I mean, they, they they did something with it. They got it. They got it over to a degree, but 
there was certainly that feeling of how they were portrayed, you know, as it related to the heavyweights that kind of made them obsolete because, you know, when you keep telling people and by, by your portrayal that something's secondary, it becomes secondary. And, and there were so many talented guys that were given so many incredible matches. You know, at the height of WCW, I, I, I would say that, you know, I mean, that, um, you know, if I was going to think about that as far as, but, you know, none of, I would have made none of those guys world champions. I think, um, I don't know if I'd have made Benoit world champion, but I would have considered it, you know. And I think one other name that, that, that I just thought about uh, uh, would be Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. Uh, who also probably didn't get really his, uh, his just due in WCW. Although I don't think Eddie Guerrero was the all-around performer. I mean, as a worker... Well, I know in, he wasn't. Yeah, as a worker in the ring, he was probably actually better in WCW or every bit as good as he is now. But all-around performer, um, he picked some stuff up in WWE that improved him a lot. Wow, especially in terms of his presentation, in terms of his microphone skills. Unbelievable how far he's advanced since going to WWE. Yeah. Right, and uh, one more question. Um, last night I was watching an, some old wrestling tapes, and uh, I came across the best of WWF Raw. From 1994, and it had a uh, Marty Jannetty versus Shawn Michaels IC title match where he came in and won the title. Oh, I remember that match was awesome. Yeah, it was one of the best matches. Of the year. I think you uh, you put you think it was the match of the year as you voted. But uh, uh, I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have voted it first. But I mean, I'm sure it was in the top. You know, it was in the list. Yeah. Um. What's the story about that? He had the belt for three weeks, Jannetty, and then he dropped it again to him. Uh, like I'm just wondering why he wasn't given a longer run with the IC title because I remember he had a shot at the Royal Rumble that year and he didn't win it. Then he disappeared. Then he came back and won it. Then dropped it to Michaels again, and then he just vanished pretty much. Never really was, didn't get any more single title reigns or anything along those lines. I think that they never, um, the two things, Marty was his own worst enemy for one thing. Um, and the other one is, is that, um, I don't think that they ever thought that Marty Jannetty was on the level of Shawn Michaels, but they, um, but they knew it was a good story. And I think that that day, you know, when he came back on the Raw, it was one of those things, uh, it was in the early days of Raw, it kind of established Raw. You had something that, like, you know, people weren't expecting, and then you even had a title change in a day when title changes meant a lot more. Um, so I think it was the right thing. But I think that, like, when Marty won the title, it was to shock people and to get over Raw and just to do something different. But in the long run, I don't think they ever had the idea that Marty Jannetty was a long-term Intercontinental Champion. I think that, you know, Sean was always the one who they were, thought was going to be the star, and they were just looking for a, to keep, you know, start a feud with Sean, and, and, and that Marty needed to win more than Sean on that day, which he did. Right, and uh, by the way, that was the first ever title change on Raw in the history of Raw. Yeah, so so there you go. I think right. that was to establish, you know, that titles, you know, that the title could change hands on Raw, and and also su establish the surprise aspect because if I remember, um, I don't think Janetti was advertised ahead of time. No. Um, I mean, I remember like, wow, Marty's back, and he won. You know, like the, yeah, as I rem as I remember that night. My recollection is that it was to add to the unpredictability factor of Raw. Yeah. Um, and the fact that Sean was such an awesome worker, and, and, and Marty stayed with, you know, on that night. Boy, you know, I mean, and, and they had some great matches, and I remember the, the, that one, as I recall, was the best between the two that I saw. All right, and before they go, um, Mike, uh, like I said, you, you're a great announcer, and you have a lot of, uh, uh, you, you know, you're great with the Mexican luchadors. Um, before I let you go, I just want to know where's the, where's the whereabouts of Liz Mark, and I'll hang up and listen. Thanks, guys. Liz Mark, junior or senior? Uh, junior. Junior's still wrestling in Mexico, but any, any yeah, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen his name listed in results. I haven't. I don't think I've seen him on any of the TV shows for quite a while. Yeah, he must be working um, independence because you're right. I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen him on CMLL in a long, long time. And you know, there was a lot of people too that when when you take that first look at him, be, you know, because of his size and everything, that people really expected the world of, of Lismark Jr. He was. He was. Um, you know, a couple of those guys, and I think Hector Garza was the same way. They came in and they took that little bit of adapting time. And um, that, that, and then everyone in WCW just like soured on him. But those those guys, and I think Hector obviously, as, as history would have shown more than than Lismark, uh, Hector's a guy who they totally dropped the ball on. Yeah, and, and someone who I think I would love to see back on the TNA shows. I, yeah, I, I wish he was. I wish he was on the show. He just really added uh, a little different element to that show that you know that maybe is missing. You know, I mean, like it's it's not like he's an American superstar. But I mean, when when you watch, as as you do regularly, when you watch the the show, he just actually on the TV. It's actually been a couple of months, but on the TV, they've just for the last uh, I don't know what it's been a couple of months or so. You know, started showing him on the CMLL shows, and he carries himself like a superstar. And when he came to TNA, he walked around like he was a superstar. And you know, the the people in the I mean, I remember the people in the building. They really in that, in Nashville, Hector Garza was a was a star of those people. Yeah, he was able uh, to. 
to fight through that uh, that language barrier and absolutely bond and connect with that audience because he is so good in terms of his expressions, in terms of his, uh, his demeanor in front of the crowd. And you know, while you brought it up, uh, I just have to say that I, I've really enjoyed watching some of the CMLL uh, TV shows. Boy, in the last uh, month or so, have just been tremendous on Galavision. They're about, I guess, they're about ten, twelve weeks. Tape delayed, is that right? No, I know that that that, that uh, we're around the Olympic period now. So yeah, so I mean, I see the what is it? The um, looks like August when they do the promos, right? Right, right, right. And but just uh, especially the stuff uh, revolving around Pero Aguayo Jr., uh, Negro Casas, and El Santo has just been, I think, about as solid as Lucha work gets. Yeah, both in terms of in-ring and in terms of angles. It's just been fantastic, the stuff that's been on there, the Galavision the last few weeks. Well, Pero Aguayo Jr., you know, I mean, I, you know, was he 25 years old, I'm thinking? And, you know, you talk about a guy, you talk about a, a guy there, and there's so few of them, and it's one of the things that worries me about this business is, with the possible exception of, like, you know, Randy Orton, um, you know, how many future legends do we see right now um, in this business? And, you know, and, and to say that about Randy Orton is probably uh, premature, but I, and I think that... Um, you know, Pero Aguayo Jr., I believe, will be, you know, someday um, regarded as, you know, kind of like El Hijo del Santo is with El Santo in the sense of maybe um, maybe not as big a historical star as the father, but a better worker than the father. Already has established himself, I think, uh, in that same vein as, uh, as Santo's son has, and, and he's already, I think, by far surpassed his father as a worker. Yeah. Let's go to John in Brook, New Jersey. John, what's going on? Not much. How are you guys doing? We're doing really good. All right. I was just wondering. I was reading that uh, the WWE was sending feelers to uh, America's Most Wanted, and what were your thoughts about that? And are you guys worried that, like, if they go, that the WWE are going to kill them? Well, that's that was that was a news story last week, Mike. I guess you can update everybody on that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great that uh, TNA has talent that uh, WWE is interested in, and uh, I think it just you know increases. Uh, our level of visibility when stories like this break, but uh, John, I can tell you that AMW has signed with TNA. So That's good because I really don't want to see him go because I see how I w- do I. Yeah, I see how WWE is, and I just don't want them to kill him. There's always yeah, that. I, there's I, always I, that chance. Yeah. You know, you never. I, you know, they they get their ideas. Um, you know, I mean, they, you know, there's no guarantee that that's what they would done, but. Uh-huh. Um, when they get their ideas that they want to bring someone in to kill them, um, they usually do a pretty good job. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I do have to say though that I think that if AMW, if they would have made that move, I think that they would have been really one of the standout tag teams uh, in WWE today, and, and that you know that also speaks to the fact that that the the tag teams up there, boy, they you know there really isn't much depth. Yeah, was, there's like no tag teams anymore up there. But I'm, I'm glad, definitely glad, that they decided to resign with TNA. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, very welcome, John. We're going to go to Lee in Kansas. Lee, what's going on? Hi, guys. Hey, Mike Janay. Um, I remember I'm a longtime fan of, of WCW, and I was sorry when when uh, McMahon bought him out and everything. I, that was a sad day for me. But I wanted to say that uh, I'm, I'm it's even I'm, sadder I'm, now. <laughs> I'm just out the military and. Uh, uh, I had an opportunity to meet the World Warriors uh, before before Hawk passed away, and I was I was really sad when I came back from Korea, and I found out that he had died. I, I mean, I was that that hit me hard, man, because I had just met him. Just shook his hand, said they were looking forward to to uh, signing with WWE, going back and making an impact. And the next thing I know, he died in his sleep, and I thought that was just a sad day. It was a sad day for me, especially because I was looking forward. To see him come back, you know, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an old school guy, you know. I'm into the old school wrestling. I, I like the days of the NWA and, and uh, early UCW, you know. Um, and also, I found out also that Nikita Koloff is actually from Minnesota. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and that uh, him and uh, him and uh, Mr. Perfect ran ran in the same circle. I mean, and come to find out, you know, I, I really found out. That wrestling is a real close knit community. Everybody pretty much knows each other, and, and, and the guys, you know, and how successful, you know, everybody. When it, when the guy looks good on TV, everybody involved in that ring they, has a role to play to make that guy look good. At the same time, if the timing of the stunts and all are not there, 
the guys really get hurt. And, and that's why I have a really newfound respect for how they actually make it look real when, when in actuality, you know, you, you have to really be strong to, to pick up a guy that's that heavy and, and body slam him like it, it's effortless. You know, I mean, those, those are some real athletes that's in that ring. I think that Lee has been educated to the ways of the business. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's when press, you know. Okay. Okay, Lee, thanks very much for your call. We were going to go to Robert in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Robert, how are you doing today? All right, Dave, how about you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I had a, um, wanted to ask you a question. Uh, with the recent downside of the business in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. as a fan, what would be the last storyline that you remember being captivated by? Uh, I liked uh, the Mick Foley stuff uh, earlier this year with uh, with Randy Orton. Um I like that. I, I possibly, I, I don't want to say the storyline, but the interview, not the one in Manchester, but the first Ric Flair Randy Orton interview about a month ago, where they, you know, right before they set up the Taboo Tuesday match, I thought that was tremendous television. Uh, but, 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 um, you know, again, and then they've already done the cage match and everything like that. But, um, yeah, I would say the Foley storyline. Um, but, you know, the whole build up to WrestleMania was real good. Um, I mean, there's been good stuff this year. I, I really liked Raw the first several months of the year. There were so many great, um, so many great matches on Raw for the first, you know, couple of months of the year. The, you know, six man tags, Shawn Michaels, Benoit. Seemed like there was a four star match every week, and then, um, uh, you know, it hasn't been as good lately. Um, I think everyone knows that, and there's definitely, uh, it's been a big lull of late. Well, it seems to me like other than the guys that's been around at least ten years, everyone is so generic and so cookie cutter. I say that all the time. I complain about it all the time. I write it all the time. You know, bald, big bald buff guys with tattoos, um, or just the everyone with the same haircut. You know, that same preppy haircut. Everyone rests on the same style. You need more variation. I, it's a broad generalization, but it does epitomize one of the problems. That's why the guy from Tough Enough caught your attention. Um, the black guy, the African American guy, absolutely. He looked different. Yep. He looked like uh, someone from the '80s. Um, but which isn't necessarily bad. And, um, yeah, I think you're right, because, boy, that, uh, yeah, that guy caught my attention something fierce. Anything else, Robert? We've got to head out in about ten seconds. Uh, what's the latest on the Bret Hart situation? As far as? Uh, he's, doing a play in, he's doing a play in Toronto starting in about a week. Oh, uh, so there's no more negotiations with WWE? Uh, there's been nothing with WWE of late as far as negotiating, you know, as far as doing the DVD or anything like that. No, they haven't even, they haven't even talked. They did make him an offer for the... Um, 20, uh, 20, um, the 24 7 thing, like a lot of the guys, but um, they're not close to a deal on that at all right now. Okay? All right, thanks very much. Thank you, Mike Tanay. Really had a great time. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. Okay, we'll be talking to you soon. Don't forget, uh, we'll be back every Sunday night. You listen to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline Radio Network. And, yeah. and, and, you know, the whole thing is, is that, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of guys, you know, I mean, we've all seen, you know, AJ Styles and everything like that, who's, you know, great wrestler. And, other, and, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not the only one, but people don't see these guys as stars. And, um, you know, for twenty nine ninety five. the other thing is is, is on, on pay-per-view, and I've really seen it. I'll tell you, I saw it Tuesday on, uh, the, on the uh, WWE Taboo Tuesday, and I saw it again on Friday on the UFC pay-per-view, that people are far less willing to spend the big money on pay-per-view unless they think it's going to be can't miss. And people now are thinking pay-per-views are missable. I mean, we've seen it. WWE made a big mistake. Uh, running, I think the two pay-per-views a month, and I think they really need to get away from that. I think that that, I think that lesson's been 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 taught twice now, and um, you know, you, and with UFC, I mean, if you don't have the main event, people will skip the show. I think and, what you're saying is there's just so much product to choose from when it when it comes from grabbing that that pay-per-view sports audience coming off the two huge boxing matches, the multiple. WWE shows, the UFC show this week. So, boy, you're right, Dave. It's uh, there's it's it's a discerning viewer out there that's gonna you know point down that money for the pay per view. So, that's why you have to you really definitely have to pay that off once you do get that viewer. Boy, it's it's gonna be tough though. Yeah, you're gonna have to give them you're, you have to give them a good show, and, but you're also gonna have to make them feel that it's worth it with um, some you know stories that happen at the show. And I mean with with Hall and Nash coming back, obviously there's going to be some sort of a story and some sort of an angle with that. But uh, it, it better be good. Um, I mean, you know. Well, the whole show has to be good. I mean, the show has to deliver uh, from an in-ring standpoint, uh, from certainly from an angle standpoint, from an announcing standpoint. You know, the pressure's on everybody to deliver on November 7, and 
I think that we're, you know, I think we're ready. I think it's... How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. Brian Alvarez is not here right now, although he's expected to join us before the end of the show. Uh, he's uh, actually doing an acting gig today up in uh, Seattle. But we do have uh, Mike Tanay, who is already on the line from uh, Las Vegas, the uh, head, head, uh, host of uh, NWATA, which is the first pay-per-view. Uh, first Sunday pay-per-view, of course, on November the 7th. Talking about that, as well as anything else you want to talk about. We've got a couple of lines available at 1-800-878-PLAY. So if you want to join the show, you can call in right now and you can get on board very quickly. Mike, how are you tonight? Dave, I'm doing great. How's everything going with you? Ah, everything's going pretty good. Going good. Um, I guess uh, a lot of stuff we can talk about today, and I know that, uh, that you're pretty much caught up on the WWE stuff, as well as obviously the TNA stuff, and I think the first thing, since you're here, that we should talk about is uh, the TNA show on the 7th, and uh, your thoughts on, you know, this is, this is a big thing, because you've got to get off to a good start on this one. Um, there's a few, you know, we always talk about, like, the, the carrot dangling, you know, and, 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 and different things in the future. You know, you, you always want to, you know, when... when the company isn't, you know, necessarily knocking them dead. You know, you know, there's the thing that you hang on for is you hung on for the TV. Um, the TV shows that its ups and downs um, has not maintained the audience. Um, there was, but of course, the TV still could get a better time slot. You know, it was it was getting your foot in the door. You had to do that. And now the move from the Wednesday pay per view to the Sundays, which should save the company money. Virtually everyone in the company that I've heard is is behind the move. But you got to make the Sundays work now. Boy, no, no question about that. I do think the move was inevitable, and I think it was, uh, you know, from, at least from my standpoint, I, I think it's time now that, that we really, for, for the, the best long-term aspect of the company, that we go to the special, uh, you know, once a month Sunday three-hour pay-per-views. Of course, the realization is going to set in on November 7th that we have that one chance, I think, to make that, that first big impression on that show, and as a result, I would, I would just be shocked if I would be surprised if everybody from top to bottom in that company, from A to Z, to have their working boots on in an effort to make this a very memorable show for the the TNA fans. And it's going to be a big one for us. There's no question about it. And I, and I think probably the you know the biggest event in the two and a half years of the company's history, in, especially in terms of how we go forward from there. Um, I think it's the biggest since maybe the first show. Um, as far as um, just it's it's you've got to get up on the right foot and um, you know get some momentum also uh, coming out of it for your TV show. And I want to ask you now. Now this week on on a Wednesday night actually is a real big night for the company. And in a sense, you know the pay per view is big for your regular viewers and some people who might be trying something out because it's traditional Sunday and because it's the biggest show in company history. But Wednesday is a taping for Best Damn Sports Show, period. And on that one, your company is going to be exposed to a general sports audience, to more non-wrestling fans, I think, than you've ever been exposed to before. So um, it's, you know, certainly it is your best opportunity to make new fans, um, you know, on this, this, two, this two-show taping on Wednesday that will air sometime between November 8th and November 12th on Best Damn Sports Show. Yeah, I think it's it's really huge for us. Uh, one of the things is, as I deal with uh, the TNA product on a regular basis, is just getting the word for a minis match. I think that um, there might, you know, there might be a chance. I don't know if you can get, you know, something with that, um, you know, to cross, you know, a lot of promotion on that station, and maybe even on other things. If you can do some sort, you know. The key is if, if you can work with them to do some sort of a big angle to lead to something on a pay-per-view with a high-profile thing, get some guys rubs. Um, I mean, it's hard. I mean, believe me, I rack my brains on a daily basis, you know, trying to come up with, like, you know, the brilliant idea like Mike Tyson and, you know, and Steve, <laughs> and Steve Austin that, that turned uh, the WWE around in 1998. Um, but that's, you know, that's what everyone, you know, that's what the business needs right now is that idea that, catches people that really have not been paying a lot of attention to wrestling and gets them, you know, um, you know, I mean, I, I know it's the million dollar idea and, and obviously nobody has one <laughs> because Boy, and, and that audience is out there. And, and I really believe just in, in, in talking to people on the seats and talking to people at airports, uh, restaurants, casinos that I go to, you know, I really get the, the impression that there is 
an audience that once again would come back to wrestling uh, if, if handled the right way. And, and I think our biggest obstacle at this point is just getting the word out to the people that we exist, period. Uh, and I think that that's something that these best damn sports shows are going to take at least uh, – you can at least take some of that hurdle and some of that obstacle down and, and get the word out about the product and, and try and direct people to watching the regular shows on Friday. Well, yeah, the, it's, I think your other big obstacle is, is and I, I think the one thing that we've really learned um, over the years is that this is a business of star power, and it's so hard to create new stars um, when the business is down. And it's actually fairly, e when the business is up, it's actually fairly easy. Out to the masses. And I think that that's something that this Best Damn Sports Show really has an opportunity to do for us. I think there's a chance for a lot of crossover potential in terms of the audience here, uh, being able to get exposed during time periods that, uh, you know, that, that people that have not had the chance to, to set aside time on a Friday afternoon or that they haven't gone out of their way to tape it or TiVo it. This is going to be a chance also for us to, to, to wave the flag and let them know that we do exist. So I think it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be big for the company. Uh, I am excited about the pay-per-view event coming up on November 7th, the Victory Road Show. I think there's, there's a little bit of something on this show for everybody. I think there's some, potentially some really terrific work with AJ Styles, PD Williams for the X Division title. I'm uh, going to see a lot of the high flyers involved in that X Division gauntlet. I think we certainly have recognized personalities on this show. Uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper returning with a pit segment. His surprise guest. We also have Dusty Rhodes, of course, and the the vote, the fans vote uh, for the director of authority between Rhodes and Vince Russo. And you have a main event that is that is really just loaded with intrigue. You have Jeff Jarrett, Jeff Hardy for the NWA World's Heavyweight Title. It's going to be a ladder match in playing to Jeff Hardy's specialty. And then you also have the the X factor, that equation of the outsiders being thrown into the picture the return of Kevin Nash and Scott Hall to professional wrestling, and the intrigue there is as far as uh, where those individuals, really where their loyalties lie. So I think there's, uh, it's, it's a show that I'm excited about, and I think uh, November 7 is going to be a big step for us. And that's the first big step, and the second big step is going to be those uh, Best Damn Sports Show tapings, which actually are going to come up this week. It's going to be a very busy week. Well, the one thing with the Best Damn Sports Show thing, and um, um, Brian Cox and Monty Brown are going to do a tag match, and Tom Arnold is going to 